Sonia, hey, welcome hey. back to In Conversation. It's, Thank uh, you so much for having me. Oh, it's great to have you. Thank you so much for your time. How's things going? Well, I'm in Kingston, Jamaica at the moment. Things are, it's, we've started a new year. We are looking forward to a COVID less 2023, but of course we know things are heating up, but we adjust. We adjust. I think we've all done well as a human race. I think right so. To some of our challenges in the past two years. And how's the, what's the vibe in Jamaica? What's the feeling? Are people feeling upbeat? Are they, are they, are, is it, is it are people looking forward to 2023? What's yeah, you, you know, you know what's what's really good if you know anything about Jamaica. Obviously, Jamaica is a party capital. Um, Trinidad can claim the carnival capital, but certainly Jamaica can claim the party capital. And uh, certainly the loudest city on the planet, as I call Kingston. But we've seen such a rebound in terms of the entertainment sector. Lots and lots of events. I'm, you know, studying reggae festivals, for example. And I see new festivals emerging on the landscape. So food festivals, music festivals. We have a coffee festival that's coming up. And of course, in February, we celebrate Reggae Month in the way that um, Black History Month is also celebrated. So lots of things. We are, we are now in a, in a really vibrant moment for um, entertainment activities in Jamaica. Well, and all these festivities, festivals and things are all part of that broader Jamaican and Caribbean culture. And just for anyone who doesn't know, you're basically the culture doctor. Um, and I know you're obviously well known as a cultural studies scholar um, and someone who's very much involved in Jamaican culture on a daily basis as well. So I just wanted to ask you what kind of drew you to cultural studies and especially to Jamaican culture? Oh, wow, James, that I don't know if we have enough time for that answer. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, let me make it a little bit brief for our viewers. You know, I, many persons wouldn't know that I started out academically falling in love with geography. Yeah. And geography, which is interdisciplinary by nature, you know, you're doing biogeography, climatology, you're doing a bit of geology, you're, you, you know, you're doing human geography, cultural. Yeah, it's, it's all interdisciplinary. And I really fell in love with geography from, from I, I was about 12 years old. And I was constantly with my parents going out to the beach, going out to, you know, driving around the island, looking for my grandparents or my other relatives. And so I, and, and, and I was also traveling as a, as a young woman in Jamaica very, from very early as a, a early teenage, teenager. So I had the opportunity with my geography interest to be exposed at several levels, not only nationally, but also internationally. And I think that must have spurred some interest because of course, you know, when you're moving from one location to the next, whether nationally, you know, in, in Jamaica, there are different language, you know, sounds, different nuances, different um, intonations. There are things you are, you're having to, to, to learn and relearn and unlearn in a national as well as an international context. And I think that would be the thing that made, from I was 21, 22, James, I was saying to myself, I love this business of having to unlearn and relearn. And I actually fantasized quite a bit about wanting to be in a country where I didn't speak the language and didn't know anybody and just to see how I would adjust. And I think that's the stuff of cultural work. You know, you, you, you really, understand as a student of culture how important it is to drop your own biases and to enter in a space of of learning about new contexts new people new new situations and so that's a short explanation <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, i love that um, i love the, the connections between geography and culture because i think they're often missed by people and obviously with your academic especially in jamaica i imagine because you know it's such a beautiful country in terms of its geography and landscape. And I, I mean, it, it must have had some impact on the culture. So in a, in a sense, geography gets branded, and we know why, as something that's more the natural sciences, but people don't look at it as, you know, as a, as a subject in the humanities as well. And, and I was fortunate because I, 
I entered into geography from the humanities. I was a student in the in the humanities and education faculty at the time. So I I, I entered into thinking about geography from you know an, as an art student, and that has followed me because I I went into the social sciences briefly, and that rounded out my my interest in research and my capacity for research, social science research in particular. But then I went, I, I came right back to the humanities where I find my own disciplinary home, as I like to, to say. Well, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, your mission as the culture doctor. And, and basically, I, I know that you've said in the past that for Jamaicans and for Jamaican culture, generally speaking, self-definition and the ability to tell your own stories as a nation, as a people, is really important. And I think you've obviously highlighted uh, Reggae Month and of course Black History Month, which is coming up. Um, so with, with that in mind as well, what's kind of, what's your, what's your mission? And, and, and is, it, is it in time with this notion of self-definition and, and with you know, trying to enable people to deconstruct their own history and culture and retell that story? How, how do you see that playing out? As a culture doctor, my mission is absolutely to make sure that every Jamaican knows the contribution of Jamaica to the world. Every Jamaican at the, at the drop of a hat, without thought, at the subconscious level, is able to understand what is Jamaica's value in the world. And, and so that has something to do with worldview, but it also has something to do with identity. It has something to do with how much we are going to value ourselves in the midst of that. And I think part of what is challenging for me as a Jamaican is how much we don't know about ourselves and how much we look externally to, to others to, to see ourselves. And, and that's, that's a big thing, James. Every yeah. Jamaican, I say, ought to travel outside of Jamaica to understand how people outside of Jamaica value Jamaica and its contribution to the world. So, so Jamaicans are not very insular people, but there is a disconnect in how much we understand our value and place in the world. And so this is, this is definitely a part of my mission because we, 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 have, we have somehow begun to, to take that for granted, our place in the world. We, we have taken that for granted. We don't know that we are the only country on the planet to have given the world in the latter half of the 20th century, you know, seven to eight genres of music, distinct genres of music um, in, in, in terms of a, a, a sort of formidable creativity. What I talk about as a creativity quotient, a high creativity quotient in the context of our, our, our own country. We don't, we don't know that we just, you know, live vibe and, sit every day and create and we don't we don't actually know what we're doing if worse to think about it at, at an industrial level to monetize to understand how to 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 look at a value chain to look at scaling to look at ways in which we we can transform to co to collaborate we're, we're not thinking um systematically and collectively about that so my mission is large, James. <laughs> and very important, um, I would say as well. So yeah. It's interesting that you touch, we're touching on identity um, and, and kind of the, the worldview of Jamaica, which I think, uh, although this is a generalization, uh, I think a lot of people, the first thing they would think about would probably be music um, or perhaps Rastafarianism as a, as a religion and some of the, the, the tropes and associations of that. And, do you, that's kind of a mythology, right? And and is that do you do you think that do you think there's a lot of confusion in the world about what what, what Jamaica is really about, um, or do you think through all the the culture of music and things that it's able to export that really is a true representation of, of Jamaican culture as you see it? I think it's kind of difficult for people to get confused about Jamaica because one, Jamaica is loud and noisy. People understand it to be the party country. You come to Jamaica, you want a party. But also, people do understand that Jamaica's main contribution to the world musically is reggae music. And of course, many persons use reggae as an overall category to, to talk about Jamaican music in total. But there are different genres of music. But reggae is understood to be message music. And it is absolutely the thing 
that has been an avenue through which messages out of Rastafari as the only religion of the this last millennium created. Um, it, 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 is, it is understood. So, so, so people see Jamaica as a, as, a, as a centralizing force, as an anchor in the world for truth and rights, for you know, systematic statements about um, oppression, black oppression in particular, um, conscientizing around you know, self-determination and self-sufficiency. Those, those are things that, that are understood about Jamaica. What's less understood, but, but perhaps the more frightening part, not so much contradictory, but frightening, is the way in which Jamaica also shows up in some other kinds of extremes, extremes around crime, extremes around violence, extremes around things like femicide, you know, um, extremes around a sort of sexual, um, sexually explicit music and, and braggadocia. Certainly it shares that with a number of other musical genres. I can think of hip hop in particular. And even Afrobeats, people, you know, more readily identify the quality of feel good music and so on and the dance ability. But they don't hear when Burner Boy is talking about his gun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the so, so Jamaica gets um, referenced quite a lot and easily for the kind of music that is negative. Certainly, we can recall the ways in which Jamaica got really hit. Some of our artists have still not really recovered from the bashing they got in relation to um, murder music, let's, let's call it that. And, and the way in which homophobia becomes this, 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 this tagline added to Jamaica as a country out there where music is concerned. But we've moved far from the early 2000s and the late 1990s when and certainly the the the, the early to, to late 1990s when this homophobia was rife it still remains as one of the, the 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 hallmarks of jamaican music you know especially if you're in a live event there's going to be some artist on stage locally who is going to talk about you know the the ills of 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 conolingus the ills of of all forms of oral sex um and certainly um homo, homo homosexual um, activity, but the, you know what is what is really interesting about Jamaica is that the young people, the the millennials and those afterwards, there's a sort of silent majority, not speaking, but they are certainly not upholding the discrimination that we have we have been known for in the past in relation to to certain forms of of, of love. So you know, Itana. Tanya Stevens, there are a number of artists who make it very clear that they perform, Spice, very clear that they are performing for people all over the globe. Their fans are in all sectors. And, and it brings us, of course, right back to the question of identity. What are some of the, the, the things that we need to, to leave behind but forge ahead in a positive sense? And so one of my missions in terms of, you know, what you asked me before as a culture doctor, is certainly to understand what is it that needs social transformation now in Jamaica. So we are this big cultural capital, but socially we are we are we are inept in some things. We are we we can identify some pathologies, as I like to call them. You know, crime and violence. That's that's a serious pathology. And so, where the music is concerned, as a major influencing force in our society. We need to be able to say to ourselves, with the murder rate as it is, 44, 45 per 100,000, um, top five country in terms of murder capitals in the world, what do we need to do as a people to adjust and to influence those who might want to commit um, acts of violence or criminal um, acts to, to, to say to them, you know, no, we don't need to be those people. And I'm not suggesting that Jamaica is 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 any more um, prone to crime than any other country, but a, a country of three million people, it's not 144 million, it's not 350 million, it's not um, a billion. 
why can't we control crime? You think about a country like Japan, the the, the murder rate is is point zero um, two or something like that per hundred thousand. It's 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 and e and that's even with the United States having military bases where lots of crime is is happening in in Japan. You know, it's 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 we we need to be able to as a people of three million understand ourselves and be able to adjust. Thank you. Um, you touched there a bit on some of, I guess, the, the myths and some of the negative connotations and associations. I guess some of the things the media definitely regurgitate the uh, sort of images associated with, with dance hall. But I wanted to ask you a little bit about the ecology and the evolution of dance hall. And I feel like you've mentioned some of the newer artists and some of the artists who represented different, um, I guess, points of view and has some of whom like Tanya Stevens are you know hugely impactful I know in the UK and elsewhere around the world and have become some of the you know top artists to listen to. Um but yeah just yeah well how do you see how has dancehall maybe evolved since since it's it had a, obviously a massive heyday again in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s and then we're seeing it evolve and have another you know huge resurgence right now. But I think there's a lot of new artists who represent um you know, maybe sort of you had the trap dance hall and the new age dance hall artists, but also you've had this moment where some of the big names, you know, have had a, a, a global stage again through things like the versus battles, for example, with, you know, Beanie Man and, and, and various other artists as well, you know, Super Cam, things like that. So, yeah, how, how do you how, where, how do you place dance hall right now in, in Jamaica? And, 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 and are we seeing an evolution and what are the sort of the main tropes and things that we're seeing? So some people will actually say that we are we're onto a new genre of music. I'm not so sure. They, I leave that to the musicologists to thrash out. Yeah. You know, they call it one beat. They call it trap dance hall. There are all kinds of names floating around. But dance hall is actually the longest um, running popular genre in Jamaica. So if you know the artificial, um, you know, moment of recognition comes. In 1985, when people recognize the slinting rhythm with Wayne Smith and so on, um, and the what they they considered to be the computerization of of these rhythms coming into being, but before that, we had you Roy who was toasting on the microphone in the way that we know dancehall artists to do. So I do not subscribe to the artificial 1985 moment. I think right. that's not organic enough. Mm -hmm. um, and we have been doing things as a people in very organic ways. So, but to think about the evolution in terms of genres, um, there's quite a bit of anxiety in the society, not only about what the young people are doing in terms of trap dance and the movement in terms of genres, but what it is they're singing about. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I don't think this moment is, is any different from the anxiety that was you know, they are present with, with the emergence of mental, the emergence of reggae, the emergence of, of dance hall. They were considered Bugu Yaga music, you know, music from the oppressed music that was, you know, it's of the degenerates. So the marginalized people in the society, and, and it's the same anxiety now. There's no difference. What is different is that our murder rate is on the rise. And where music is concerned, there is absolutely a link between those who consume and produce music and those who are considered to be criminals. So we have had, for example, a number of our artists being, being, being imprisoned, convicted for various crimes, whether rape, um, you know, murder, attempted murder, and so on. And... Some of our big names, whether it is Buja Banton, Vibes Cartel, Ninja Man, um, Jack Cure, there are a number of, of persons, Capleton, Elephant Man, some of, of them accused, um, if not um, you know, taken through the courts and, and arrested. So we, we do have some concerns about what the music represents in terms of that evolution and certainly the moment now when we can track all of the numbers in terms of major crimes, rape, murder, um, you know, robbery, and so on, uh, on the rise. So we, I remain concerned, not only as a scholar, but certainly as a parent, as a citizen of this country. But I want to, I want to flip the, the, the coin to 
to certainly understand that the Janus faced elements that we've been identifying about Jamaican music. So on the one hand, quite spiritual and connected to some very deep rooted um, identifiers for the black race, certainly the African diaspora in general, the black Atlantic, as I like to talk about it. And on the other hand, this association with violence, some of its major stars being imprisoned and so on. That Janus face quality is very important because it tells us about something that's deeply rooted in terms of a historical tradition of, of violence. It's a society forged on violence. We have a history of colonialism, a history of exploitation, a history of oppression, and even the very entertainment um, practices we're talking about, you know, outdoor events in the communities rooted in terms of um, night activity. No event in Jamaica uh, worth its salt is going to start um, heating up before midnight. Yeah. Don't go before 10 o'clock. You know, there is a certain tradition that we can trace historically. And this is why I, I really love it. It's my book and it's not because of my book, but I, I really like Dance Hall from Slave Ship to Ghetto as a, as a compendium of, of the kinds of um, performance practices we've had from even prior to um, you know, this period of enslavement and colonialism and so on. So I trace these things all the way back to an African past where entertainment is rooted in some very communal, collective systems of honoring um, the very power of community, the very power of the, the, the people who function to amplify um, values in the community. Some of those things I think are are very much present in Jamaica still, but we we have we have moved to to a place where the state and its apparatuses have remained oppressive forces in the context of our entertainment uh, practices, and that's one of the things I'm really documenting, James. Across the African diaspora, we see quite a bit of persecution. Here it is on the one hand, so I'm back to this Janus face quality. Here it is on the one hand, these are things that are putting children through school. You know, they constitute areas of livelihood. They are, they are creative work in terms of how people can earn a living, you know, really take themselves out of poverty and so on. And on the other hand, you have things that function to suppress these very entertainment practices. So the Noise Abatement Act comes into question the ways in which apparatuses of the state, the police force, for example, can use the legislation to go and arbitrarily lock off sound systems in the way that they operate at the community level. You know, arbitrary lock offs at odd times when what we ought to be doing would be to put systems in place, entertainment zones, for example, to have a healthy, vibrant, productive, and um you know um financially viable entertainment sector so we are not looking at the best practices of countries like germany or the netherlands where they have you know night czars there's a night economy that is understood and there is a way in which they are tracking the the contribution to the economy the, G the gdp for example from things like um entertainment activities so we we've got it twisted, and we are we are in fact reinventing some of the ways in which our col colonizers oppressed us, mm -hmm. and and those are some of the things that are very dear and near to my heart, James. That we must understand that we must we 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 have to act differently. We can't we can't we can't become the leaders in a in a in a in an emancipated um, post colonial context and still remain oppressors. Yeah, very good point. Very interesting. Well, with, with that in mind, then, you it sounds like that's a, a real preoccupation of your research at the moment. Um, could you tell us a little bit more um, about how you're sort of mapping that and, and what, what, what your sort of objectives are? And then I was also in light, in light of that as well. You, you mentioned Vibes Cartel earlier, and, and I recall hearing you speak about Vibes Cartel in the past and saying that you would, you would never write about Vibes. 
And then I know recently you you did a really interesting article that that I think was based on a lecture that Vibes was involved with. And I wonder if you could unpack what 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 why, what, what what you what made you not want to write about Vibes initially, and then what drew to the performer more recently, um, and then maybe sort of unpack a little bit about that part of the findings and the objectives and how it links to this larger research project that you're working on right now. Yeah, nicely tied up there, James. Um, I, 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 you know, I'm not a fan of Vibes Cartel. I like some of his songs. They move me. If I'm on a dance floor and I hear them, I'm completely, you know, moved. And I can think about just how exhilarating it is to feel that beat, those beats, those those bass lines in the early music that he produced but but once he became someone that you know began feuding began talking about and 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 you know positioning himself as a as a gunman positioning himself as someone who you know was a a, a kind of god in dance hall you know golly god it was one um name being used by by Mavado, his his arch enemy, and um, Vibes Cartel, the world boss. So they had these names, you know, positioning themselves in ways that were beyond the self-aggrandizement that we are used to seeing in the context of these performance practices. But certainly, you know, beyond beyond, and I and I stratospheric, and I I I I, I certainly from a spiritual place, I rejected that. And so I said, you know, there's no way I'm going to write about somebody who doesn't move me in, in, in a way that's, you know, to my core. I don't want to be writing about something I'm upset about all the time. <laughs> but there came a point when I said my responsibility as a scholar um, made it necessary for me to, to write about Vibes Cartel. And I, I, I found the right association because I was interested in, in the comparison. Um, between Vibes Cartel and Tupac Shakur and Vibes Cartel made it easy for me to, to enter into a conversation about him because he acknowledged Tupac Shakur as his, his favorite rapper. So they were taking cues. There is always this cross-fertilization that's happening across the, the, the Atlantic Ocean. So our you know, brothers in America and sisters, they were taking cues from our, our people in the region. And certainly you will see the same thing happening now with Afrobeats, quite a bit of collaboration happening across within that, uh, that Atlantic sphere. So Tupac Shakur, as somebody that I liked as a rapper, made it easy for me to enter into. And I, I, I began, James, this is what is so interesting. I began to understand Vibes Cartel a little bit more. Right, yeah, that makes sense. The eyes of Tupac Shakur. Yeah. And that... He really patterned himself off of these hip hop stars in the context of Jamaica, in the context of Jamaican dance hall, where we have rooted ourselves in a different kind of way. Jamaica is rooted in Rastafari, rooted in a certain degree of spirituality. This is why artists such as Sizzla, Bujabanton, as two of the, the quintessential examples. You can hardly separate whether they are reggae artists or dancehall artists because they embody both things and it is so intertwined. It is, it is so much at the core of who they are as performers. Vibes Cartel really was more a rapper than he was anything else. And so I began a conversation at that point in my scholarship on social transformation and black masculinities. So Vibes Cartel, Tupac Shakur, you know, Tupac with a, a softer side, but Vibes Cartel certainly as a bad man. Mm -hmm. You know, you see him on a stage performing, especially in that clash with Mavado at Sting. A bad man, positioning himself as a, as a bad man, nothing else but a bad man. And uh, that for me became interesting. He, became, he, he is considered a folk hero in Jamaica. Very much revered, loved. You know, people immediately, once he was in, in, imprisoned, 
um, just started saying free world boss, it became an anthem for people. Mm -hmm. And so he remains incarcerated, but but certainly loved, and people are waiting for the day when he is he is released from 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 prison. Of course, there's another conversation that we can have one day about that whole prison industrial complex that occupies our imaginary and reality in the in the Atlantic, the Black Atlantic. Yeah. And um, I am interested in having that conversation because I'm. I am of the view that that incarceration doesn't help and that people go into those institutions um, in one, one way and they certainly come out in some cases worse. So at the University of the West Indies, for example, we have partnered with um, Bard College, we've partnered with colleagues at City University of New York, their John Jay College, to do this prison to college pipeline program. And we're about the Institute of Caribbean Studies to go into spaces such as the Tower Street Correctional Center to do classes with those persons who have been incarcerated. So on the one hand, this, this social transformation is engaging with music, but it's certainly also engaging with some of the, the ways in which, you know, the society is not functioning well, even for people who are incarcerated. So the social transformation agenda is large. It must touch everyone. It's not targeting anybody in particular. Um, every Jamaican has a role to play in how we transform our society beyond these pathologies I'm naming. And my scholarship must reflect that. Thank you. Again, excellent points and uh, fascinating stuff. And I could ask you 10 questions just on that. But one thing that's just come to mind again is you're talking about this contemporary moment and some of the i guess some of the interactions between hip-hop and its subgenres, and then dance hall and it's and this idea of the black atlantic and the back and forth between say you know cities and well now broader you know just the, the american cult country and that of jamaica use it but hip-hop's having like an interesting moment as well because it was almost and again i speak about certain subgenres here as well like you it was almost like in the 90s it was all about you know, getting out of the game, getting out of the hood, getting out of the streets, and then being a professional artist who then tells their stories to try to, you know, sometimes lionizing criminality, but often to sort of show people different paths and alternative ways of maybe getting out of the ghetto or getting out of crime, criminality. And then obviously hip hop's gone up and down and had many different moments since then. But right now, you know, it's a, a very, very violent, not in necessarily in terms of the music itself, but in terms of the realities facing the artist. We've had some maybe close to 40 American rappers slain um, uh, either at the hands of like fans or people from their community or from fellow rappers um, in the last, you know, five years or something like that. Whereas that, the reason I think about this is because, you know, we're talking about Tupac and vibes and, and thinking about you know, Tupac was a martyr, Biggie was a martyr, and they, you know, they prophesized their own deaths through their own rap music and things. But, you know, there was, there was a handful of, of, of these figures from prominent music culture like hip hop in the 90s that ended up sort of being slain or um, incarcerated. And now it seems like so many, I mean, a lot of it is, of course, product of the system, especially in terms of using incarceration to silence, you know, these powerful prophets in a sense. But you know, this this um, interesting how it's gone and gone full circle and some of the positive messages are getting lost somewhere, but just how now people, almost like rappers are going to the streets to try to authenticate their music, whereas it used to be getting out of the streets to authenticate their life. I mean, I'm kind of kind of spitballing there, but what are your thoughts on that? And how is, how is, is that reflected in Jamaican music too? Or is this a, a product more specific to hip hop? The, the the evolution in in Jamaican music, I think, in in some ways, mirrors what's going on in 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 hip hop as well. Um, I think there's more a mature conversation happening in the in the context of the United States in relation to social transformation because of the ways in which police brutality um, has become, you know, sort of synonymous in a sense. The 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 the, the move in terms of the Black Lives matter movement was directly um targeting the the ways in which blacks were just being being killed by by police 
and so defund the police all of that associated with that that movement but i i've been tracing like you the ways in which black stars and i'm calling them that deliberately icons of the communities the black community have certainly been 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 targeted and i and and i'm not suggesting that they are not involved in some things that would require them to be put behind bars or certainly be punished but you know there are examples so many examples um music is associated with this stereotypical ghetto um and the the hood in the in the u.s context and and these these places this is why geography is so important to me these spaces come with a certain kind of ethos there and and a certain perception a certain stigma the people who have become creatives out of those spaces of struggle and risen above those spaces are still targeted in, in the spaces that they occupy but these spaces have stigmas attached there they carry a, a history of of simultaneous association with with, with world-renowned excellence these ghettos and, and the hood but of course they they are spaces that carry a history of degeneracy by means of poverty criminal activity and incarceration and and we can go as far back as blues right you know um lead belly chuck berry um rick james you know james brown i turner old dirty bastard um slick rick 50 cent little wayne um r kelly right wiz khalifa snoop dogg all of these people um in the united states con con context but in jamaica we have the very same list toots hibbert denroy morgan super cat papa san ninja man i said be before mavado luciano you know, Capleton, Elephant Man, Buju Banton, Jack, you are busy signal, merciless, some of whom have, have served time in the United States, right? But these that's the Jamaican list on multiple charges from you know drug drug trafficking, um, marijuana and cocaine possession, assault, including sexual assault, robbery, you know, gun possession, murder, and so on. And so in a real sense, you know, reggae and dance hall sharing the very same associations, um, almost a carbon copy of the kinds of challenges faced by hip hop and rap across the Black Atlantic mus music scape. Mm -hmm. So it is not very difficult to, to see the associations and to, to, to make the, the, the case for a real focus on social transformation because these there is a reason we know the history we know the history and we know that the spaces that we are talking about the ghettos and and the hood they actually have systemic challenges that then um cause a certain kind of cyclical movement in and around these very same challenges so you know unless we you know bob marley said unless you you mash up the whole system it, it can't change suppose this is exactly what we need to do i i i i want to begin with making sure that people understand and so education becomes a major part of how we must um, make that change is that kind of one of the main objectives that you're you're trying to achieve through your research on black masculinities? Absolutely. So my research is on social transformation and it involves an examination of black masculinities. Um, it, in, it involves an understanding of, of sound, what it is that that is so notorious about these sounds. Why, why are they being cast in, in, in ways that um would lead people to be singing about and reflecting the kind of lives they are living which are which are so are so are so problematic mm -hmm. so the music can't be any different if the communities remain the same and uh, i also wanted to just ask you some of the terminology that you're using like you were talking about black masculinities in the black atlantic it's making me especially as a brit think of the work of paul gilroy 
Um, and I just wanted to ask if, if he's an influence of yours and if you you two have, have worked together or if you plan to work together or, um, or, or, or yeah, if, if that's kind of a, if, if you share some of his viewpoints. I'm putting it out there. I would love to work with you, Paul. <laughs> if anybody's <laughs> hearing this, send Paul a message. I've been privileged enough to meet Paul, to have a chat with him in his home in Britain. and. Um, you know, discover that he knows exactly who I am and my work. And of course, being able to tell him how much he's been an inspiration to, to my own work. And so when I talk about Black Atlantic, I'm absolutely invoking his own work and uh, making sure that I, 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 I brand that intellectual continuity. And I always um, reference his work in my own work. There's, there's no other way. <laughs> And of no, course, you know, Stuart Hall's work becomes an inspiration to to all of us who have, yeah. in the context of our cultural studies, uh, made sure to understand the politics of culture. Do you think the figures like Stuart Hall and then um, obviously someone still working like Paul Gilroy get their, you know, their 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 flowers get their, you know, are they celebrated enough? Because I think they're hugely important. Um, obviously beyond their work on black masculinity in the black Atlantic, but so much of their work can be extrapolated and used by, you know, interdisciplinary scholars and, and often is. Do you think they're celebrated enough? Certainly, uh, we have had some criticism in Jamaica. Stuart Hall is Jamaican. Um, and we have not in Jamaica given him the flowers he deserves. Not enough, certainly not enough. There are other names we could call as well. You know, contributions from people like Barry Chavans, who brought the study of Rastafari into the university in Jamaica. Um, and I, I, I want to say I am I'm heartened by the kind of, you know, recognition that, that certainly over the last 10 years, more work on Stuart Hall, more of his writings in particular being studied and more of his writings becoming available. The, the publishing houses like Duke University Press, certainly. Um, the, the, the University of the West Indies Press, and certainly um, the work out of the UK, um, in that institute that he set up, uh, and, and, and all of the films that have, you know, become available about his work. So we, we, we have come a long way, and I think that there's much further to go. Cultural studies has not managed to to, to make a leap beyond its place in the 1980s um, and 90s. But we, I mean, certainly we remember the, the demise of the, the, the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies at Birmingham University, but the, the decentering of cultural studies has happened in a way that universities like the University of the West Indies have a role to play and, and play that role in systematic ways too to advance the, the discipline of cultural studies. Again, excellent point. And it just makes me think a little bit about the process of decolonization within cultural studies as well. And um, I guess, especially with Black History Month coming up as well. Do you feel that that has enough momentum? And is that is that an important issue for you? And do you feel it's going far enough? Um, That's a really interesting question, James, because the I'm, I'm not sure that I think there are some in I think the moment is different. Mm -hmm. we talk about that that conjuncture. It's it's a different moment. And I think that what's happening, decentering of cultural studies almost looks different today because there are people within many disciplines that are doing interdisciplinary work and actually, you know, in their work giving a nod to cultural studies and its interdisciplinarity and its multidisciplinarity and its intertextuality without knowing that that's what they are doing. So in a sense, there is that decentering of cultural studies in ways that are formal and ways that are, that are informal. So that decentering capital D and common D. Yeah. And I think that's pretty important. That's pretty important that something is becoming so routinized that people, whatever waves, you know, of the 1970s and 80s um, happened, Th there is an impact 
that cultural studies made so much so that people are doing cultural studies and wanting to claim that they're doing cultural studies. That's one of the things I'm seeing more and more. So a decolonization of, 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 of the kind of academic spaces that we occupy has happened in a way that is, is sort of silent, but there's so much more to be done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your comments on that topic as well. Um, and before we close our proceedings today, we've spoken about Paul, spoken, spoken about Stuart Hall there briefly and, and about their need to be celebrated. But I would just like to say, you know, myself and on behalf of our listeners, I'm sure I'd like to give you your flowers because I think the work that, that you have done um, and you continue to do is vitally important. And moreover, it's just really interesting as well. It's very readable um, and very prescient and important. And I think it's really important for a cultural studies scholar to be talking about, well, one, things that influence them and culture that they're part of. I know you're a fan of dance hall yourself, you know, I know you, you, you still like to get down with the music and that's important. Um, and then again, yeah, to be able to reassess and to, to talk about characters like Vibes Cartel and to put that into a broader context. Really important and really fascinating research. So I want to say thank you to you um, for all the important work that you are doing, have done and continue to do. Um, so this is really a great opportunity for people to go and do some research around Sonia and um, and the work that she's done. Check out her books um, and, you know, watch the space because there's going to be a lot more coming over the next few years. Now that you have a little bit more time and you're not so tied down to administrative responsibilities, which um, okay. I know academics have to do, but it gets in the way of the important fun stuff sometimes. Um, so what's... Um, What's next for you? And do you have any just final comments you'd like to say to our audience? So I want to thank you, James. I received those flowers, you know, um, very graciously. Um, what's next for me? I'm I'm working on a couple of books, um, number of projects as well. So book projects, but also other projects. I'm involved in something that's quite exciting. We have this grant from the European Union and the ACP which gives us some, some funds for the first time ever to really do a regional look at the cultural and creative industries and their development. And you know, of course, we are a region that's been almost founded. We, we've come out of slavery on the basis of our creativity. So it's, it's very interesting that we, we now have a moment to consider the value of those industries and how we want to develop them. I'm also working on some other things to develop curriculum around carnivals and festivals. And that's a project we've been doing in collaboration with the Caribbean Development Bank and the uh, Bahamas John Kuno, for example, and the Center for Festival and Creative Arts at the, the St. Augustine campus of the UWI, in addition to my own Institute of Caribbean Studies. But then in terms of books, the, the, the subjects we've been talking about, that um, social transformation forms a core component of a book I'm working on at the moment about the, you know, just a bit of sonic notoriety. And it comes also out of another project we've been working on, which would be mapping sound systems globally with colleagues of mine from Goldsmiths working on sonic street technology. So lots going on, James, and lots to come. You know, really exciting stuff. I guess, you know, I really have to give thanks because I'm privileged to be working in areas that I like and with people that I like. So um, my disciplinary home is one that I really and truly just cherish. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thanks for your wonderful answers. I think a lot of food for thought there. Um, and I know I personally am going to go away and um, check out a few things and uh, continue my um, sort of odyssey into dance hall and find out a bit more and listen to some more tunes. Um, but Sonia, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate your time. Um, and we'll catch you next time on In Conversation. Thank you so much, James, for having me. It's been, always, it's been a pleasure. It's always a pleasure. <laughs>